Good afternoon, everyone. I hope this presentation finds you very well and that your school year is just off and running and just doing some amazing things and that everything's working out like you had hoped it would and that you have a little energy and that you are just ready to learn how to meet students where they are. Good afternoon, my name is Carmen Scoggins. And again, I just wanted to thank Travis for inviting me to spend some more time with you guys. I'm sure by the end of the school year, you're gonna be <laughs> sick of hearing my voice, but hopefully um, I'll give you some strategies and some suggestions. I think this is one of the most challenging things we have to do in the world language classroom in any classroom is to consider that Students are kind of all over the place. And so it's our job to, to figure out where they are and how to better meet their needs. And so hopefully I'll give you some strategies for that today. Again, my name is Carmen Scoggins and don't hesitate to reach out to me at Carmen Scoggins at Gmail. And you can have total access to this presentation, not just this video. So the presentation is tinyurl.com slash NH student support for New Hanover student support. So go through it later when you have more time to decompress and let me know if you have any questions. So our goals together uh, for our time together are, I can embrace what my students bring to the classroom. Again, wouldn't it be great if every kid were, was on the same page with the other kids in the room and we could just do it and go and move forward? And yes, it would be, but guess what? That is not reality. So some kids who seem very apathetic, they don't seem to want to be in the, the classroom. I bet they have something to offer the classroom. So you just have to really get to know your students. I, I talked about that in our last time together that building your student relationships is just critical. So the more you get to know about them, you'll, you'll see the joy and the things that they can bring to the classroom. I can recognize when my students need more time to process information, absolutely. Again, it would be great. We know that the, the destination is gonna be the same for everyone, but the journey is probably not going to be the same. So we need to be flexible. We need to give multiple paths for student success. And I can brainstorm ways to front load and scaffold information. A couple of education buzzwords that we love so much. But again, hopefully I'll give you some ideas. If a child can't learn the way we teach, hmm, maybe we should teach the way they learn. <laughs> That's a novel concept, isn't it? Again, it would be so much easier if everyone could just come together and we could just all do the same thing at the same time. But that's not how we do anything in life. Think about just the way we get our entertainment now, how we stream everything. I want to do this. I want to watch this. Someone else in your family might be upstairs watching something totally different. Everyone kind of has their own approach to life. And that's what these kids sitting in your classroom, that, that's what they're bringing to you is a, a plethora of challenges and, and different energies and different um, motivations for, for wanting to be there. So we have to keep all that in mind. And again, that's what makes this so challenging. But again, I think too, that's what makes teaching so much fun and just so enjoyable because it's not gonna be the same every day and we don't want it to be the same every day. So I want you to know as a classroom teacher of 29 years that I see you and I hear you. So again, as we go through this, don't think, wow, Carmen's got it all together. <laughs> this has been a, a real journey for me as well. And it's constantly something that I'm working on. So here we go. It is my thought that the World Language Classroom is just the perfect loading zone, if you will. Think about what we do naturally, just with the multiple modes of communication. We, we get kids up and out of their seats. We ask them to use their voices. We draw, we act, we empathize, we, we connect learning to emotion. Because we're talking about such different kinds of topics than it, what's happening in the rest of the school. So we're helping move all this information into our students' experiences and into their memories. So keep this in mind as we go through. We're going to start with what we know best. You know that everyone's journey is different, as I just mentioned. We might all even be in the same car together, <laughs> but I am, I'm wanting something out of this that maybe the person beside me isn't and vice versa. So we have to just keep all that in mind as, as we talk about the, the different elements that we're going to discuss today. But We've got to start regardless where what, with what we know best. And those are the three modes of communication. Think about how this is going to work. Now, um, we've got, again, this is just so natural for us because students, this is differentiation right here. Students listen, read, and view. 
they they communicate with speaking and writing and then they practice and revamp and, and speak and write. So we're also just through what we get to do every single day. We're working on so many other skills than again, what students don't seem to get in other classrooms. Now they might get um, something from a, ma a math class that they're not getting from my class, but I dare say that we really cover the gamut in the world language classroom. So we have to start with, with what we know as we have this discussion about meeting students where they are. And again, I'm gonna ask you to think about this from the teacher's perspective and the student's perspective, because we're all in this together. Um, we do all the stuff on the left. <laughs> we have to plan. We think backwards, but we also have to remember, oh, our students are going to need more processing time maybe than we planned for. So think ahead, think of almost troubleshoot and say, hmm, what, what might I need to reteach at some point? Also, the zone of proximal development, moving the unknown to the known for our students and the gradual release of responsibility. Um, again, a lot of education ease there, but letting students take more ownership for their own learning. And I really think they'll see that you're trying to support them and that um, you're trying to, to meet them where they are. Also providing scaffolds for the students because they're gonna need that. Obviously learning another language is very different than again, anything else that they're doing in the building during the day. It is not like they can learn the stuff I'm gonna teach them in unit one and just forget about it. No, they have to take that language with them all the way throughout the end of the semester and hopefully into the next levels of language that they teach and, and eventually in, into college or into the, the surrounding community, their outside world so that they can build their proficiency, right? Differentiation, again, we know that every student sitting in our classroom is very different. And so we, we have to think through how we're gonna approach this. But again, letting students choose, letting them take ownership is gonna build so much empowerment. So as we have this discussion about five topics we're gonna to hit, um, think about it from kind of this, your point of view as a teacher and your student's point of view. So I mentioned these questions before in the first professional development I did with you guys, Carmen's Favorite Things. These are four questions that I, I truly live by. Um, this is from the PLC at work. Um, the D4 concept, what do we want students to learn? How do we know if they've learned it? What will we do if they don't learn it? Key. And then what will we do if they already know it? This is where I fall short. I, I can do this. I can figure out what I want students to know, be able to do and understand. I can figure out how I want to assess them. And I'm okay with what do I do if they don't learn it? Well, I need to reteach. We need to loop back around. But what do I do if they already know it? How am I challenging those students? Um, and that's where some of these topics we're going to talk about hopefully will come into play. Okay, so this says meeting students where they are by dun dun dun. These are our five topics front loading, differentiating, executive functioning, learning targets and planning, and scaffolding. So we'll hit each of these. I'll give you some examples of what I do in the classroom. I'll give you a couple of tech tools that I often use to support each of these as well. Okay, so let's start with front loading. What exactly is front loading? Okay, and again, a lot of these things are gonna overlap. So just be aware that, wow, you, you might say, oh, you could have put this in differentiation or you could have put this in scaffolding. Yes, <laughs> all of these things are tied together um, and they're they're inextricably linked. So, but let's start with front loading. What even is front loading? It's pre-teaching, right? Um, it's making teaching and, and learning intentional. It's making learning um, visual and visible. So I suggest you be intentional. You help your students visualize learning and, and then you're there to observe and adjust. But we we give our students now, we've um, I mentioned to you in the first video that you watched that we changed our themes last year after the chaos of COVID and everything. And we just really modernized our themes. And one of the reasons that we did this um, is so that we could better almost start from scratch so that we could front load more information. Instead of doing more traditional things um, like verb charts and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, if you do that, I'm not criticizing that at all because that still it has a lot of power, but we basically just give kids the words they need until they become second nature. It's pretty powerful to watch um, a level one student use a structure that before we would have 
meticulously taught everything, all the forms, and then they wouldn't know why or when to use them. But now we just give them what they need and that's called front loading. And one of the other things we do is to teach them how to even approach learning a world language. So we have our students brainstorm the five C's or the world readiness standards, just so they can know this class is not going to be like any other class they're taking. We might introduce a theme or a concept by just putting up some kind of um, online sticky notes, or you could use a jam board. This is Lino it. And so my level threes were brainstorming. What do they already know about Spain, for example? And what do they want to know? So that's the reason for the two different color sticky notes. But this gives me an idea of, of things that they might already have within them and things they want to learn more about. But this is front loading because I'm asking them to think about what they already know. Also, maybe introducing uh, a short story. Again, this is level three, so we read a, a version of Juan Bobo. I know, remember, I'm a Spanish teacher, so again, all my examples are in Spanish for all you different language teachers out there. So hopefully something I say will resonate and you can say, oh, I could do that, this idea with this particular thing that I teach. Um, so we, we read a, a, a version of this, and so I might give them some images to try to talk through and brainstorm before. What do they think this guy's gonna be like? And you know, how how does he seem to live his life? Things like that. So before we even get into the story, I'm front loading images and concepts that they're gonna need to help them understand the language when it's time for them to read it. Again, maybe introducing a theme with trivia so that you don't just start giving them all the stuff, make them work for it a little bit. Everybody loves trivia. Like that's such a hot thing. Um, it has been for a long time and just the competitive nature of students. So you can put these images up or you could have them race. Um, again, these are my, my level threes would do this. So as you know, they work in teams. Um, and so they might try to compete against another team, but basically they're just trying to get information out of uh, or find out information about Spain in this case. Um, before we even begin a, a unit on the past and history and, and Spain and the two past tenses in Spanish. So it's kind of a cool way to think about front loading. Also using authentic resources. Again, you know, I'm a big hashtag authorized person. And it, I might show this video. This is about a, um, a school in Spain. And we don't do a traditional school unit anymore with our level one students, but I can still give um, my students this video as a precursor to a discussion that we're gonna have about our school and about uh, just when it falls within our new themes and all that stuff. But, you know, and they can already begin to see, oh yeah, so this is, these are things that I'm gonna see as we begin to talk about our own school experience and, and stuff like that. So again, that's front loading through an authentic resource, which is even, even better. And just, you know, moving, more vocab uh, into, into a deeper understanding or just using that visual connection to, to help with memory and processing. And there's a lot of research that says if students physically write or draw, um, then they're gonna remember more. Now we use the computer a lot because we have the technology. I'm very blessed that we are a one-to-one -one school. So each student has a device. And it's, it makes a huge difference, but sometimes I just have them do things on paper because I'm like, you have to physically know what that feels like to write it um, or draw or whatever. This of course is, is digital. This is the tool whiteboard. And we were just, again, starting with some actions, things they might do during the day or things that people around them might do during the day. And they draw a representation of whatever the, the verb or whatever the sentence is that I'm giving them. And it's just really funny. I think this example up here was the verb enseñar, which is to teach in Spanish. And instead of drawing anything, a kid just Googled a picture of me and smacked it on there. <laughs> so it's like, oh, but that is the way he's going to remember that action, right? Um, this is a little TikTok, super cute. And this I, I've left in there because even though we're not going through COVID anymore, this is um, llegar, which is to arrive. And when we started school in 2020, that fall, every kid had to have their temperature taken and all that stuff. So that was the kid's way to remember arriving at school, masked and getting their temperature taken, which is horrible now that I think about it. But it was cute at the time because that, again, helped move that what that verb is in Spanish into their working memory. 
Okay, so all that's front loading and that's super fast, but a couple of tech tools. Each of these is clickable, by the way. If you are what are going through this without my video in the way, this is my Bitmoji finger. And every time you see it, it means that the, the things are clickable. So you can click that and go straight to the site. Line of it is just online sticky notes. Canva, you know what Canva is. You can do anything. And since front loading is a lot of maybe creating some kind of visual representation or maybe some kind of mind maps or, or graphics for students, you can find all that kind of stuff in Canva. And then whiteboard is the where each kid literally on their phone or their device, if you have access to that, um, to a computer, then they each have their own online whiteboard. And it's just like the old school whiteboards that you physically write on with the markers. If you have those, it's the exact same concept. So just a couple of things that, to think about with front loading and getting students ready to learn, set for learning and success. Okay, let's move on. Meeting students where they are by your favorite word, differentiating. <laughs> so of all the things that we do in the classroom, this is probably one of the most important, but also the most challenging because like I said before, kids are all over the place with where they are in their learning and we're expected to differentiate all the time, but I guarantee you, once we start having this conversation, you're already doing more than you realize. So let's get to it. Not every kid learns the same way. Just take a look at these different icons I chose as I made the presentation. This just reminds us that, wow, each kid is different. Each kid is approaching what I'm sharing with them in a different way. They're internalizing it in a different way. I know my learning style preference, um, and, and I'm sure, me just talking to you like this might not be your learning style, but you're also an adult and you kind of know how to, to handle it. But for students, you know, if you're teaching middle school or high school, then you have to just explore lots of different options because they're going to get bored really fast. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately. So Carol Ann Tomlinson is the queen of differentiation. Right. And she suggests that there are there are many different ways you can differentiate, but the three we're gonna focus on and the three that she focuses on a lot are differentiation or differentiating by outcomes, task and choice, okay? Now, this is the one that, well, let me say this first. The world language classroom, again, is the ultimate room for differentiation to take place just by the nature of what we do. Again, because we're functioning with the three modes of communication, because of the different types of activities we're going to ask our students to do, that's differentiating. I mean, there, there cannot be a, an easier way for us. At least we are halfway there, maybe. So now if we can be a little bit more intentional about how we differentiate, um, your students are going to benefit even more. So let's get back to the three ways, outcomes. And this is the thing you're already probably doing, where you give the same thing to all the students, but you kind of expect different things from different students, depending on the knowledge you have of the student or maybe a pre-assessment that you gave or um, the last thing that you worked on, you know the student is weak in this, so how can you better meet their needs? So you sort of accept different qualities of work from students, if that makes sense, and you know you do it. So guess what? Ta -da! You're already differentiating because that is one of the, the things that you can do and it's okay, it's okay because your high flyers are gonna be able to give you more. That's just natural. That's where they are than someone who's still making progress, but just not at the level that that student is. And that's that's differentiation. Also differentiation by task, where you might prepare, as it says, multiple activities, and then you assign them to different groups based on strengths, interest, et cetera. Um, you might do some stuff like that, but again, this is, this is um, a little bit more challenging because it takes more planning and a lot more front loading on your end. Now, this is where you can shine to differentiation by choice. And I do this a lot. Um, try to give options to your students whenever possible. Not only um, does it help you kind of see where they where they go and what they what they think their strengths are or even their weaknesses. Sometimes when I give choice boards or something to students, I say, if you know that your um, weakness is listening, then do the listening just to challenge yourself. And typically they'll do it because I suggested, but also they know that's what they need to work on. So, um, but maybe it's just because I've given them the, a topic that 
they really are interested in and that motivates them. Whatever I can do to help create a little bit of intrinsic motivation, that's what I'm gonna do. And so we approach differentiation by a, a lot of different things. Again, my go-to is using authentic resources because I can differentiate the task without changing the text. I can ask maybe, you know, I might have three different Google Forms with varying levels of questioning that I can ask, different groups of students that I know can handle more information or handle less information. Or I might give three options and say, you, you start where you think you are. And then if you wanna choose a different option, then you do that. Or I might give an authentic resource with, with um, one with a, a word bank or one with like an actual transcript, like let's say it's a video and the students are struggling to understand. So I'll give them the option. Do you wanna do this activity without the, the script or the word bank or with it and then let them choose. So again, it's, it's all that, that idea that, hey, I, I'm the student, I'm the learner here, and I get to have input on, on how I want to approach this activity. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Something that my colleagues and I have been doing for a few years now that just really changed the way we do a lot of things is um, a, a colleague, Anne Marie Chase, she's a Spanish teacher in another state can't think of where that might be, somewhere out west, I believe. And she's amazing. And she knows I, I talk about her stuff. She has given me permission. That's the beauty of Twitter. <laughs> and she does these things called a, um, uh, an ABC rubric or something like, I mean, yeah, that's what she calls it, an ABC rubric. So we'll give students, again, an authentic resource. And then they decide what level they want to try to reach. So the top level that got cut off a little bit is a C, so they're novice low. If they can just give me some cognates, just words that are similar in both languages, and that's where they stop on the Google form, then they'll get a C, they're novice low. Novice mid, they give me the cognates, and then a couple of sentences in English about what they think the infographic or the video or whatever is about. But they reach the A level, the novice high, if they can give me the cognates, the sentences, and then more specific details. And most kids are going to go for the A, just again, in the in the inherent need of, oh, I got to do the best I can do. But if, you know, it's okay if a kid stops at C, because maybe you can have a little conversation with them and say, now you might have looked at this infographic and said, I just can't do it. But just why don't you try to give me one or two things, you know, in English and see and just see what they're able to do and begin to build a little bit of confidence in them. But we use these all the time um, just to kind of gauge what what students can recognize about the language without it's it's always the, these what we call quick checks are always related to our theme, but they're always using an authentic resource. So that works really well. I can give you more information about that if you're interested. Um, choice boards are great. I, my colleagues and I use Slides Mania to create the choice board. Again, the, the, the emoji finger is not there, but this is clickable and you can see the different kinds of activities we ask students to do. Um, the top line is presentational. The bottom line is interpretive. That's the two skills we were working on. And so they had to choose one thing from each line. It depends on how, it's depending on how much time we have, how much we ask them to do. But again, they get to go through each idea or each slide that we've prepared for them and decide how they're gonna demonstrate what they know or are able to do and understand at that moment in time. So choice boards again are brilliant. And I have a physical choice board in my room that I can swap out. It's just got folders. I don't think I have an image of it, but I stopped using it because of COVID, because of touching, <laughs> everybody's touching the same stuff. But it's it's, now that we're sort of coming out of that, it's also a, a, maybe a place you can have in your classroom where students have like, maybe there's a slip that they could draw with a QR code on it that gives them some kind of instructions about what they can do. It doesn't have to be super formal like this, but it's fun, they like it. Um, the, my level three students, even I, I even differentiated their final exam. You can see this is the fall of 2020, but I've done it the past several semesters as well. So. Remember my threes work in teams. And so there are 12 options. They had to choose three that they would do alone and three with their team. Now, that took me a while to assess and I, I have rubrics for everything, but I wanted to give them some control on the final exam. We're a non-state tested area. So we have a lot of flexibility and we do a lot in level three. 
that's kind of, I didn't want to overwhelm them by giving them just a straight up big comprehensive final. So I kind of separated it out into the different things that we did. And they really seem to like this and they do very, very well. So differentiation. Also by um, just using animated shorts, uh, I'm going to do a tech session for you guys um, later on in the year, or maybe you've watched the tech session already, but you hear me talk a lot about Edpuzzle, just the way um, giving students an animated short and then letting them almost vocalize, verbalize literally through writing or speaking what's happening. I can get a lot of different um I, I can hear what students can do with the language. And again, if their level is a little bit lower than someone else, it's okay because they're giving me what they can and that's all I can ask for at that time. So um, just using these really open-ended kinds of things so that students can generate what they can on their own. Again, some tech tools are Nearpod. It's sort of like Pear Deck, if you're familiar with that, where you can, um, again, students, you can see what students are doing in real time. Edpuzzle. I'll talk more about in the tech session, it's my favorite. Um, Adobe Spark, again, is huge because there's so many different templates that kids can choose if they're doing something presentational, they get to have that choice. And Wiser, again, um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit in the tech session, it's online worksheets, but you can easily change the way one, sheet, one worksheet looks that you give to certain kids versus another one, you just give them a different link. And so it, again, you can kind of meet them where they are. It's very, very useful. Okay, so we've done front loading, differentiating, and now we're gonna move on to executive functioning. So meeting students where they are by executive functioning. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you. I must've been absent the day I, they taught about this in the educational psychology classes I had at the university because this changed my life. A few years ago, I was in an IEP meeting and I kept hearing the special ed teacher talk about executive functioning skills. And I was like, <laughs> what is she talking about? I don't know why I didn't know, but of course we know, but this kind of packages it. What are executive functioning skills? They're mental skills, okay? Um, it includes working memory, flexible thinking, self-control, organization, attention span, every single thing that we need in any classroom so I'm like, why don't we focus this a little bit more on, on this a little bit more <laughs> just for general purposes? Why is it that just these um, kids with IEPs and 504s are getting these, these skills? Because these work well for everybody. So we're going to delve into this a little bit. And it, it really, really has changed the way I think about just the way I give information to my students. So hopefully this will help you out. So one of the things I do is, um, I think you guys said, you mentioned that maybe just the high school, you high school teachers use Canvas, Canvas. Um, but whatever you use, whether it's Google Classroom or even if it's just you putting something on the board every single day, um, just be consistent, whatever you choose to do. Now in Canvas, this is my homepage. So at the bottom, I list all their assignments. Canvas gets a little tricky sometimes and kids don't know where to go. Every teacher approaches their classroom differently, as we know. And so it's it's a lot for kids to remember, oh, I'm going to do this in this class, but I'm going to do this in this class. So I try to make it as, as straightforward as possible. Um, I also create an announcement each day. Again, however you choose to do this, it could just be a Google Doc up on your, your screen if you're the only person in your classroom with a device, but kids can kind of see what the plan is for the day. Now, since since I've um, cre did this presentation a, a little bit, or <laughs> since I'm redoing this presentation for you guys, I have changed the way I word my announcement. So I still have a greeting, I have my Bitmoji, I have our learning targets for the day. But instead of saying task one and two, like it, they are here, I say line up and then I just have one, two, three, four, and five. I thought for some reason that task started to sound a little bit too, uh, <laughs> like too much, like we were doing all these things. Not that one, two, three, four, five, six doesn't overwhelm some kids, but at least they can see what's coming. And sometimes my kids will be like, oh, the, we're already on number four. We're going to make it today, Scott Dog. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to make it because, you know, best laid plans. Sometimes things happen or there's a groove that I don't know, maybe you have a fire drill or whatever. And the beauty of doing this is that I can just think ahead. I can skip activities if I need to. I can reshuffle them and I can just move them to the next day. And that way they're, they're just 
very, it's very consistent. Kids know exactly where to go and how to start. And that helps with executive functioning skills because they can control, they can see it and they know what's coming. Also just, um, you know, thinking about all these games that we like to play with kids, you might say, man, I play blue kid or gim kid or quizzes or Kahoot or whatever all the time. I feel a little bit guilty about it. Don't because we need a mental break occasionally as well. Right. And also these kinds of rote games are help helping students to move things into their working memory and eventually into their long-term memory. So Every time I ask kids to give me some kind of reflection, what do you like that we do the most? Of course, they're gonna mention these because they are game-like and they, they're fun and competitive and whatever, but they say and explain to me, these have helped me be able to not have to think so hard and just be able to recall when I need the, the word or the concept or the, the phrase or whatever, because we've done it, we've practiced, okay? Also the, the concept of, um, of leveling up and the power of yet and growth mindset and making sure students know that they're not going to be perfect all the time. They might not understand something yet, but that they'll eventually get there. So again, having students write some sentences, this top row, you can see if you speak Spanish that they're all wrong, <laughs> but I know exactly what the, the, the students were trying to say. So is their message communicated? Well, yes, it is. But how can we level up? How can we take it a step further? How can we make it a little bit better? How can we um, be more accurate so that we don't begin to fossilize mistakes because we don't want that to happen either. So I talk about leveling up a lot and the power of yet. Like here's here's the sentence now. Um, let, let's try to make it stronger and better. Like my level three students right now, it's still kind of, we've been in school for three weeks um, and they're still writing as if they're in Spanish one, right? And I'm like, okay, we got to improve what we are able to do. We should be able to do more. We should be able to say more. And so um, we're, we're going to have little writing workshops where I specifically take time with them to work with them on writing skills. So, because I know it's going to serve them well in the long run and it, that'll eventually help them with their speaking because they'll see it written on paper and then be able to verbalize it. So just the power of it's okay. I can understand you, but how can we make this a little bit stronger? And some tech tools I might use for executive functioning are Jamboard, awesome. Again, the gaming tools, Canvas to stay organized and anything, the, the Google suite, just again, for organization, storage, knowing where things should be kept, that kind of stuff. Cause like I said, we, we don't use a textbook. So we just keep everything in our Google drive in folders per unit so that it's very easy for students to find information um, when they need it. Okay. We are rolling along and now we've talked about front loading, differentiating, executive functioning, and my favorite thing, meeting students where they are by planning. <laughs> Every time it's like Sunday afternoon and you say, oh my gosh, I have to think of my lesson plans for this week. But you know, you know, you like it. You know, you like thinking about how you're going to approach something. So we know backward design, it's like my favorite thing, understanding by design thinking with the end in mind, knowing what your learning targets are, what do you want your students to know, be able to do and understand and be able to recreate um, at the end of a, the lesson or the unit or, or however you're approaching this. So always thinking, what are my learning targets first? Like my learning targets right now might be, I can talk about how tired I am. Yeah? Or I can envision myself on, on the beach with a book. Now you guys live at the beach. I don't. <laughs> so this is a big thing for me. I can guess how many times I will heal bra in one day. Bra. You, are you called bra all the time? I'm like, I'm not your bra. <laughs> I'm not your ma. I'm not your bra. But that's what the lingo they're using now. And I can describe my favorite relaxing beverage. <laughs> I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can only imagine. It's red. Okay. So learning targets are important for our students to stay on track. This is all about planning. I mentioned to you in the PD that we did together this summer that um, we revamped our, our, our curriculum. It just was the healthiest thing we've done as a department in a long time. And we, we have a lot of learning targets, et cetera, et cetera. But when, when COVID hit, um, we now these learning targets do not match these. I'm well aware of that. But we had to whittle down our learning targets without watering down what content we wanted to teach. We took those power standards, we took those um, really important to know standards, and we kept them 
because we were teaching remotely and we had a lot less time with our students. But now that we're back in the classroom, we can get back into a more detailed learning target base. But these, this is like the roadmap. Again, this helps me plan every day. And as I do my little I can statements on my Canvas announcements, I might even get more specific than what the roadmap says. So I might, you know, we might have on here, like I can count from zero to 30. Okay, that's a learning target and the students should be able to do it. But if you say something like, I can use numbers in real context, or I can count the Olympic medals from each of the Spanish speaking countries using numbers zero to 30, that is a really, really tangible thing that students should be able to do by the end of our class period. So even though I, I might not use the same wording every time, I use the bigger picture, I'm a big picture person, um, to help create the, the more discreet learning targets for them on a daily basis, because I like to plan. And I, I believe that them seeing these constantly is gonna help them understand what they should be able to do. Also using um, a single point rubric, so if you're having students present information, you can put some ICANN statements right here. They can do a presentation about whatever, about what their typical day is like, about um, their, their, uh, what, what classes they have, what their house looks like, whatever you're doing, okay? And then you can have them present information and students can give them feedback on things to, to think about and work on or hashtag nailed it on this side. So things that are good that they're doing well. And, and that teaches students to be um, a good listeners and to give some good feedback. This is an example of our French teacher, one that she did, um, so how she handled it. Now I put I can statements in the middle. Hers are a little different. You had three courses. I could understand what you said. You described each dish. It's the same kind of thing. It's just she worded it a little differently. And then they give overall feedback at the end. These are super fast. If you need to translate it to a grade, it's fine. Mostly I use something like this just to inform my instruction to see if there's anything I need to think about as I plan for the next um, activity or the next day. Also, um, again, just using authentic resources to help in planning that, uh, I can't say that enough. We, if you're ever interested, we'll do a, just a session on, learn, uh, on um, authentic resources because it is just my go-to thing. And I, someone asked me the question, how long does it take you to find all the stuff? You just need time to sit and look and build a resource bank because it is a little bit time consuming, but once you have it, man, you can pull anything. And this helps in my planning because I can build the activity around the authentic resource. Also, again, just keeping things light and um, when we were locked down, you can see this was the spring of 2020. I did an online escape room with kids because we weren't physically in the classroom anymore. And I wanted to keep them as engaged as possible. So for me, this, this part of meeting students where they are is just also being aware that I am on a daily basis, I'm not going to be able to teach the way I did before. Really, we're not able to teach the way we did before COVID anyway. And I hate to see, keep saying COVID, but it changed everything about how we approach things in the classroom. So keep going with that. Keep staying fresh um, because that helps you meet students where they are. Again, using authentic resources to break down, um, you know, stereotypes and to think about how just, just how to support students and to think ahead and to think about just all, all kinds of things, diversity, inclusion, and just how to approach life in general. And so this is an authentic resource. It's a Coca-Cola commercial about eliminating prejudices. And it's about first and second impressions. I do this with my novice low, mid level one students, and I can do this all in the target language. But again, I have to think about these things through planning and through what are my goals for the day? What are my learning targets for the day? And searching for the right um, authentic resources are gonna support those learning targets. But it's beautiful when it plays out and you watch it happen. Okay, so some tech tools for, um, for planning and backward design are searching for authentic resources on Pinterest or any kind of, of the social media, Twitter or Instagram, TikTok, whatever, just everything's out there for you. You just start looking and you'll be amazed at what you can find. Okay, guys, hang in there. We are on our last of the five, okay? This is scaffolding. And you know what scaffolding is, right? If you have ever had a home built or you um, 
If you ever come to Boone and you watch at all the construction that's happening, the university has kind of taken over our little town, but there's constantly new, there are constantly new apartments being built or dorms or whatever, and there's always scaffolding on the outside. And so that's exactly what you're doing for students. You are providing them so much support until they don't need the support. And then you can begin to slowly remove the scaffolding. Okay. One way that you might think this about this is taking a bigger theme like myself, focus on a couple things you want to talk about and then giving them some language that they're going to need. Again, we don't teach verb charts anymore. We don't teach um, how to conjugate anymore. Uh, now, I might begin to show more discrete grammar in level three, but levels one and two, we basically kind of guide them by giving them, if that makes sense. So this is what we'll be able to do. I'll be able to talk about myself a lot, my friends, things I like, things he or she likes, things they like, or things that they are, that they do, or whatever. That's just kind of the world we live in, in level one, for example. Okay. This is using the site that I've mentioned a few times, Wiser. And you can see right here, here's some support, support vocabulary. So we put on some house plans or apartment plans. They had to use the voice record feature and just start describing what they could, but we gave them the beginning, <laughs> right? We already gave it to them. So maybe we do a couple slides like this. And then at the end, we have them describe whatever the, another image of a house, but we didn't provide the supports to see if they could do it without the scaffolding, but that builds over time. So before you know it, the kids are able to say all these things and you'd be surprised. They're able to transfer that information into other situations, into other scenarios. That's the point of scaffolding, okay? Also, I'm going to talk about this in the, if, if you've already watched the tech <laughs> session, I don't know, but this is a site called Clipomatic, and it allows you to create a video on your phone, and as you talk, it will type the, um, the text right on there. You can go back and add punctuation or special characters or whatever, but it does it. So if I'm speaking in Spanish, it's in Spanish. If I'm speaking in English, it's in English. It's brilliant. That's scaffolding. Some kids are going to need to see that written language more if you if you have a, uh, a written language and you don't do sign language. Okay. Also, just being super repetitive. So at the beginning, um, we're learning to talk about ourselves and others. We do a thing called compliment day is what I call it. It's kind of cheesy, but so I introduce myself, hashtag yo in tres palabras, me in three words. And I put my words down and then we all have access to the slides. And so we go around and compliment each other to it. It's you are, you are this and this and this and this and this. And by the end of the couple minutes, we do the activity if kids forget how to say you are, I just rem I just say, remember compliment. And they're like, oh, yeah, two it is. <laughs> so I know that sounds trivial, but that's scaffolding and that's repetition. And it just becomes part of what we're able to say. It's pretty fun. And it's sweet. You can do this on paper. You don't have to use technology. Um, we used to have big pieces of paper and we would go around and write things on each other's uh, walls or whatever we wanted to call them, but it was, it's just a special time and everyone has to be upbeat. This good. It's fun. Um, also giving students examples. <laughs> I don't know why we think, oh, you need to be able to do this on your own. Well, what if I'm not clear in my instructions or why, why is it going to hurt if I provide them an example? So when I ask my level threes to introduce themselves via Flipgrid, I give them an example so they can see, oh, this is what she's talking about. Yeah, well, of course, why, why not give them an example? So scaffolding. And some tech tools, again, are wiser and there's Clipomatic. And this is a site called WordWall. Again, it's just going to give um, a lot of options for students that need some support, ways to review things. So check it out. Again, it's clickable, as you can see from the little hand. Okay. This is what we talked about, meeting students where they are by front loading, differentiating, executive functioning, learning targets and planning and scaffolding. So some key takeaways, whatever you get out of this. I hope I said, I know this was fast, um, but I hope I said a few things that resonated with you that you can take back to your classrooms. Again, you know, my, my message is build relationships, just get to know those kids. That's gonna help you meet them where they are more than anything, okay? Um, if a kid comes into your class and is acting all sad, there's a reason for that. <laughs> Don't just be like, I can't believe they're acting like this today. Talk to them. Okay. Show them that you care. Pre-teach. Front load whenever you can. 
It'll help in the long run. Use the three modes of communication always. I know you do, so you're already golden there. Use your learning targets. Again, that's a no-brainer. What do you want students to know, be able to do, and understand? You got it. You can do it. Start small with differentiation. Don't feel like you have to do everything, but maybe you take one or two activities, and then you begin to build another resource bank. And just, again, scaffold as much as you can. Think about, deliberately think about the order in which you do things during your, your class period because that will really set students up for more success. Don't ask them to do something that they're not ready to do yet. Practice it before you ask them to, to do something a little bit harder, right? So that's that's the whole concept of scaffolding. The main thing is that I wanna say is you guys got this, okay? Um, I hope that this served you well and that obviously if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I am happy to share what little knowledge I have or um, what I'm still trying to learn as an educator, as we go through this beautiful journey together. And again, just enjoy being with your kids. Don't forget to reach out to me, Carmen Scoggins at Gmail, or, and you have now the presentation, tinyurl in H student support. Have a great day and just keep being awesome. And um, let me know if you need anything, meet students where they are. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording now. Awesome, stop sharing. Now I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay, you guys have a great day. Thanks.